old old dads. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Kenny Florian, dad, dad, daddy, Kenny Florian. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, I've known you from the jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu coming up, you know, Brazil, mm-hmm. <laughs> pioneering yeah, jiu-jitsu days you know, as an American. It, it's crazy, like, how, how different it is, right, now. Um, but back in the day, it was like, if you wanted to train with the best, you had to go to Brazil and, and uh, you know, there was... Compete, pr- compete it, with the best. Well, it, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean... It was a very different time. Like I felt like back in the day, if you knew some Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, it was like a superpower. You know, it was like a ma- some kind of magic spell that you you had. Um, and if you wanted to get better, kind of Brazil was one of the few places you can go to. You certainly could learn stuff here, but yeah. there there are way more tournaments. There were about a higher level, better guys, and. You were one of the first guys going over to Brazil, man, like in the early days. And I think that's when I was like, oh, yeah, like you can go to Brazil and learn there. I'm, I'm going to try that. And uh, got a chance to meet you and some of the other guys like Dave Camarillo yeah. and some of the other guys in the early days who were going to Brazil and Gracie Baja. And um, yeah, you were, you were going to Bella Horizonte, though, right? Now. I ended up moving there. Yeah. 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 Staying with Jacqueline and, and yeah, coming up there. There was only like whites and blues at the time. Yeah. At the Gracie Baja in Rio, it was all like, you know, the who's who of black belts. Yeah, yeah. So it was kind of a j- big jump, and why would you go there if the, all the guys are here? But yes. I felt at home there. Right. They made me feel like part of the, the team. family. Yeah, yeah. The team. And, yeah. And, 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 you know, in Rio, there's a lot of gringos and a lot of people visiting, right? Yes. But there I felt like one of them, and so I decided to stay there. There's also less distractions there, too. <laughs> <laughs> man there's like, plenty of distractions well, actually, maybe, maybe. Okay, okay, right? okay oh gotcha. my <laughs> god oh my god yeah okay yeah, yeah. yeah that's true you don't have the beach but right there's no there's beach. no beach there's okay, no beach there's it. no beach yeah. but yeah plenty of beautiful women uh, <laughs> yeah, that's for sure i heard it's uh <laughs> they, there was like some somebody told me a while back that it was like the the number one um, ranked city for like single guys in, yeah. in the world, and I think they have like a, a ratio, like way more women. Something to like men. I don't know, yeah, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, well, Dracolino, man, is a, a legend. Obviously, a, a dude who established himself at, at Gracie Baja. You yeah, know, yeah. was a world champion, was a champion, and mm-hmm. um, was doing his thing. And he's produced so many great guys, dude. I mean, he was he had some kind of special recipe over there. Yeah, he's a leader. You know, leader, leader. He was, uh, you know, back in those days, it was it was Fight Club and. People weren't always, you know, the most professional. It was Fight Club days, right? Sure. Um, but he was he always carried himself as a professional. He was an attorney. Mm. And, wow, I and, didn't know that. And decided to go the jiu-jitsu route instead. That's awesome. It, it's what made him happy. That's awesome. That's super cool. And so he always, you know, he worked his butt off, worked, you know, started like early morning, 6 30, 7 a.m. and taught all day long till like, you know, the last class, like nine, nine o'clock, nine thirty. Damn. And uh, yeah, man, that's awesome. Put his heart and soul to it, and yeah, he had a, still to this day, man. There's guys, you know, Lucas Lente, yep, uh, current, you know, um, Andressa, Jeez. yeah, she won the. I think she last was the last year she made the she made the Hall of Fame, mm-hmm. the four time Black Bear World Champ, you know. But yeah, the Felipe Perguis, all those guys, right? Still, still relevant, right? It's it's um it's one thing to produce guys in a certain era, and it's another thing to produce great competitors throughout like to continue doing that throughout. yeah it's i think there's very few people that are able to do that um that's that's really impressive yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm proud to be part of that first his first group of black belts you know yeah it was like four or five guys so like the first generation of his of his champions yeah so that, i think that's what made me feel like you know i want to stay here because he put his heart and soul into right into us you know i remember i forget what year it is you know you would know but <laughs> I was it was at the World Championships, and that was the first time I got a chance to see you compete in Brazil. And I think you took third that year. Was it third in the World? What belt was it? Black black belt. Oh yeah 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 uh-huh. yeah. Well yeah, we closed the bracket. You closed the bracket. We yeah. Closed the bracket. So, yeah. Yeah, dude, that was. So I beat the Danny Marais who won the next two years. Yes. Um, and then uh, and then uh, yeah yeah, and so I closed the bracket, and because Marcia Victoza was the, you know the the Gracie Baja. Yeah, the, the guy that yeah, you know, he bowed down to. He was a senior guy, right? That's mm-hmm, how you did it mm-hmm. back in the do- those days, right? And right. closing the bracket is like basically you won, right? Right, Today, exactly. It's a little bit different, right? Exactly, yeah. But back in those days, dude, that's, that's awesome. Was. 20, 2002, yeah. I, I remember that inspired me a lot. I was like, damn, an American can like go out there. And do- <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's sick. You and your brother, man, 1999. Yeah. That's late night. Yeah, and yeah, Purple Belt, right? Yeah, Purple Belt, Yeah, man. your brother, like, is cool, man. Yeah. How's your brother Crazy doing? Time. He's doing good, dude. He's uh, he's busy. He's got three kids as well. Um, I have two. He's got three. Um, three kids. You have three, right? Yeah. Right, so, right, yeah, right. he's got three. He's got uh, all girls. <laughs> all girls. All girls, yeah, all girls. And... Uh, they all do jujitsu in some way, shape, or form. The youngest one is more into like soccer and gymnastics, but Keith stays busy, man. Keith's uh, doing a great job running the academy, and um, he does a bunch of real estate stuff. He's got a real estate Florian martial business. arts, right? Is Florian the martial yeah. arts in Brookline, Massachusetts, mm-hmm. and um, and yeah, he's in the real estate business. So he you know buys and sells real estate. He does. He has a real estate appraisal company as well. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, he he keeps busy, man. He's working hard. You know when I remember when I went out to Boston and. and Stay with you guys for a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, I met like your other, your older brothers. Yeah, and so you have like your dad had like a set of three. Yeah, and then there was like pause, right? Yeah, pause like five and a half years. Five pause. and a half, years and then pause. I came, <laughs> <laughs> and it was me, Keith, and Kirk. Yeah, so six kids, man. One six, six. Kids. It's like I don't know, I don't know how someone could do that in 2024, dude. That's a lot. Of, that's a lot of kids. Three, three is a lot of kids yeah, to me. Yeah, you know, yeah, like. Yeah. Well, that break probably helped, right? Yeah, yeah. Because me and my wife, we had three kids in, like, yeah, it's like one and a half years difference, so, like, in two years. Three kids in two years because we had twins, right? Right, right. Damn, that's like, welcome <laughs> to the party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. That's wild. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a different time, man. Back, back in, I, was, I, went, I think it was the... That I just I didn't realize how many Brazilians were in, in Boston. A lot, yeah, dude. It a lot of Brazilians <clears throat> went to Boston. Um, I guess nineties, early two thousands. Um, they have one of the larger Brazilian communities. Is that the city? But the Brook. So the outside. So no. So it'd be like outside. And now I'm probably more so in Boston. But like a this place outside of Boston called Marlboro had oh, okay. a lot of Brazilians that moved there. Actually, a lot from Belo Horizonte. Actually. Oh, really? Um, and uh, it was just a good place to go and, and get work and, you know, be amongst other people in the community. Framingham has a large Brazilian community, um, parts outside of Boston um, in general. So, yeah, they've definitely had a thriving community. Yeah. Yeah, I went to, um, went to Orlando for the pans for my daughter. Mm-hmm. And uh, remember Adam Roseman? think so he was like yeah. involved with science he was like the ceo i think for a second yeah um and and uh he lives in a city called celebration okay it's like part of like disney world okay and uh it's like like mainly brazilians there and it's mm. like picture perfect homes and wow um it's you know right kind of connected in a way to like disney world disney, or the yeah. complex you know yeah so wow. uh, yeah yeah celebration yeah. celebration it's called yeah and i guess a lot of like you know big time you know, people that have money and stuff, they have they have homes there and stuff. That's interesting. Damn. So they had like a like a flea market downtown, uh-huh. and uh, I went there and it was all these Brazilians. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Speaking Portuguese. <laughs> yeah, Florida. I mean, Florida is a huge. Florida for sure, yeah. for sure. But, but that's what's surprising. It's like Boston, Massachusetts doesn't have that kind of weather. You know. And, yeah, and that's how it's cold there. Still yeah. Had, yeah, it's still much. Colder. I'm curious why they all ended up over there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Maybe some went over there and then kept it kept it going, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of it was just kind of like. Great, great work opportunities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how is it? How is it? Uh, post fighting, post. What was the transition like for you, man? After you know, it was tough. Years? It was tough. Like even you know, I was lucky enough that I had something to move to. Like you know, I, I had my gym for sure, but the fact that I was able to kind of go into broadcasting was was helpful. But it still wasn't martial arts, and at the same time. Um, I had retired because of a back injury, and that was, you know, I always said, like, ah, you know. I'll, what, what, what happened on your back? So I had um, two herniated discs, a bulging discs, three annular tears. Mm. So it was something that was just constantly nagging me basically mm. f- since 2000, I think 2006, something like that. Um, I was actually supposed to fight Sam Stout at the USA versus Canada card. That was the first time where uh, was BJ fought GSP in the first oh, fight. So okay, it was on okay. that card. Okay. I was supposed to be on that card. And I was literally packing my bags to go to Vegas. And I reached down, pulled my drawer open to kind of grab my clothes. And 
I dropped to the floor. It felt like someone stuck a, a knife in my back. I dropped to the floor and I was stuck on the floor for like hour and a half, two hours. I could not get up or move. Um, so it was pretty scary just cause I thought it was almost felt like I was paralyzed. Um, and that was the beginning of it. Um, I don't know exactly where it originated from. I, I did take a fall in Brazil that happened. I fell on a rock when back. So I don't know if it was from that. I don't know if it was just like uh, overloading of training. Was that or, the Pedro de Gavia? Yeah, Pedro story? de Gavia story. Oh, you gotta yeah. tell me story. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I, I, so I dealt with that back injury for a while. And this last one, when I hurt myself after the Jose Aldo fight, I was like, man, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get back to training the way I want. This was a particularly bad one. Um, and, and Dana kind of had already offered, hey, if you want to, work for this company you can work for this company for a long you know as long as you want and get into broadcasting so i fox hired me ufc hired me so it, it made the transition a little easier yeah, yeah, yeah. but at the same time you know i almost felt like i lost my identity when i stopped fighting and training martial arts full time so I, I worked hard on trying to build myself back up over the last few years of like training and trying to get back and eventually i was able to and and it was a much ha much happier as a result you know i think physically I've always needed to do something yeah, like since yeah. I was a kid, I was hard, like hard for me to focus. I, I needed to be able to do something all the time. And jujitsu was kind of one of those things that kind of helped like piece everything together and maybe solve my ADD yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. So I, I, although I had this great job and I was doing this stuff that I really enjoy not being able to jujitsu, not being able to do jujitsu. I felt like, um, I was kind of unfulfilled. So, when, once I was able to kind of train again and do things like that, I, I felt a lot better. Yeah. yeah. But it's tough. It's tough having to stop doing what you do, like, especially competing. You know, competing yeah. is such a, such a cool thing and it's such an important process to get better and learn about yourself. And, and when I didn't have that, I was like, man, what am, what am I going to do? <laughs> How do you feel like guys that, you know, if they fight and they have jujitsu as a, as a, you know, as a base, right? Mm -hmm. um, allows you, you know, uh, for me, uh, that's what I'd look because I, I didn't I didn't pass my like the fight medical like in 2012. Mm. And then, uh, you know, like you can't fight anymore, this and that. But I can still do jujitsu. Like you can still yes. do jujitsu. And I was like, OK, my wife was happy, you know, they, sure. <laughs> they don't want me fighting anymore. You know? Yeah. But I, could, I still had something to, you know, I still had had it stuff I could do. Yeah. And, and that's I think that's the cool thing. You know, well, <clears throat> you can certainly get your injuries in jujitsu as well. Um, number one, you're not getting hit in the head. Um, and it's still something that people can do as they get older. And, um, you know, while I've accumulated a lot of injuries over the years. I still feel like it's something that I can be physical with. I can use my mind. I can use my body. I can train for things. I have goals I can still set. Yeah. And, um, jiu-jitsu when when done properly when you're taking care of yourself you can do it for a very long time and 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 that's the great thing uh so that was one thing that i was extremely grateful to be able to come back to um because i've always found jiu-jitsu to be healing in some way shape or form yeah. like literally and like spiritually like it's it's something that that i think i need <clears throat> yeah because you when you Cause you had a, you had, you were, you know, you graduated from college, you had a career, different career. Yeah. And, uh, could you tell your story a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I, I went to Boston college. I played soccer at Boston college. Um, the goal was, um, to eventually go into law school. Um, and I, you know, had got married, uh, shortly after college. Um, and I, I, you know, I just always felt like, you know, I wanted to do martial arts full time, but I was probably Cause you were doing jujitsu through college, right? Yeah, I did. I did jujitsu through college. I started in college and I kind of was at odds with the coach. I was kind of always arguing with the coach, having something. And I felt like I had this mistress on the side <laughs> called Brazilian Jiu Jitsu that I was always thinking about and soccer got less fun. And I think senior year, I think I got in an argument with the coach and um, and I like left practice and he called me on the phone and we kind of had some words <laughs> with each other. And, uh, that was the last time I, I played organized soccer wow. on, a, on a high level. And, um, I left and went into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu full time. And 
was had a full time job uh, working. I was translating financial documents at, at a business in Boston, and um, and then was married at the time. Uh, and I went to Brazil for a training trip, and I was on Pedro de Gavia, Gavia Rock, and um, I was with Scotty from OTM and some other guys. That's uh, the the rock that people see in Baja de Tijuca. Yes, like the big rock, the big mount kind of mountain. Exactly, mm -hmm. the the same rock where Holy's Gracie uh, passed away, where he died jumping off that. That's where he was, uh, I believe, paragliding off of oh, that okay. rock. Okay, I didn't know that. So was there. yeah, so we were. You know, not at the top, but kind of midway, where we would yeah, used we, to we do used run to, with we, Gracie we, Baja. Remember right, that we used run? to run from the bottom all the way to the top. You know, exactly, pretty gnarly towards the top. Yeah. Yeah. So we we initially did that. Um, we did that climb. We did that run. Got in shape, and we were kind of descending down the mountain. We're all tired. You know, we went into the waterfall. We we're kind of all wet, uh, and it, it's like rainforest there. So like the rocks are wet, right, the moss right, right. is wet. And we kind of went off the path, just kind of like looking around, seeing what was going on, kind of investigating a little bit like dummies. And we were kind of descending down a, sleep sl a steep slope. One of our buddies had um, Blue Belt Rob. He, uh, at the time, he slipped and was sliding down the mountain and like, you know, stopped and we all kind of laughed. I think he like oh ran into a tree or something like that. And we we're like, oh man, that was crazy, you know? Mm. And I'm, I'm all like laughing about it. And then it was my turn. And we kind of kept going down the slope. And I didn't even realize that there was like a ledge there. Um, and I had slipped, was sliding down on my butt, feet first. My buddy went to grab me. I had a tank top on. And the momentum, I was going so fast that he couldn't hold on to me. But he flipped me around to now, instead of going feet first off the mountain, I went head first off the mountain. And. Wow. Uh, you know, it, this is as it was super surreal because all of a sudden I just felt nothing underneath me, and I had a reoccurring dream as a kid. I would that I would fall off a balcony and I was just falling forever, and it was like it was a scary dream that always happened. And here I was in a very similar situation, and I had that life flash before my eyes, like I saw the whole thing, and I remember like, you know, it, it was probably like a one second drop. It was like a, a twenty foot drop, something like that. So decent. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was not fun. Um, and but you know, I like literally had the whole thing like, oh my gosh, can't believe I'm gonna fall, like, I'm gonna die in Brazil. This is crazy. Like, and I remember even feeling sad during that process. I'm like, man, I was such a pussy that I didn't pursue what I really loved to do in this life. Like, I, I worked a job that I wasn't like so crazy about. I just kind of like this thing was calling me, and I didn't want to do it or I didn't do it because. The pressures of my family saying, you got to be a lawyer and you got to do this and you got to do that. Your dad was a heart surgeon, right? He was a heart surgeon. So he's like, we're not sending you to college to be, you know, a jujitsu guy or a martial arts guy, you know. And they didn't understand, like, how are you going to make money? That was the biggest thing. How are you going to make money? How are you going to make, you know, they don't want to see you suffer, right? Um, and I, uh, after that experience, I had landed on like a ledge on top of like a rounded rock. And that helped me. I landed on my back, but it, it actually prevented me from hitting my head somehow. Like, mm. I actually, like, tucked, like, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu fall. Break fall, yeah. And because of the rounded rock, like, my head didn't hit. So I fell on the rock and, it, like, knocked the wind out of me. I remember hearing the guys upstairs, like, oh, my gosh, oh, my God, I think he's dead. Oh, my gosh, where is he? One of them, I heard one of them start to cry because they, they <laughs> couldn't see me. And I was on the ledge. I was like, I'm right here, guys. La and I, like, laughing about it. Yeah, now, right? and, I, and I actually, even then... I was like so surprised that I survived that I actually was like giggling. I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm, I'm alive. Like what the hell? And if I didn't fall on that ledge, Alberto, like it would have been bad. Cause like if I kept rolling, it would have been like hundreds of feet. Then I would have probably been messed up or dead. Yeah. Um, and you know, we descended down the mountain. They came down. I had to like climb up. They pulled me back up and we descended down the mountain and everyone was just freaking quiet for like, 30 minutes no one said anything and the whole time i was thinking like man like here's this opportunity for me to kind of like look at my life in a different way right and whether that was a real near-death experience or not to me it was very real and two weeks later i quit my job told them i was going to work part-time and go into martial arts full-time so I was teaching privates and like doing workshops and competing as much as I could yeah. with whatever money I had, which wasn't much. And then ultimately, um, I ended up getting divorced. I think with it within that year, 
Um, you know, it wasn't a popular decision for me to go from something that was secure to going, yeah, I'm going to do martial arts. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but I'm not sure. I went and talked to my instructor at the time, Roberto Mai, and, you know, told him that I wanted to open up a school. And, you know, um, of course, I had to, like, look for a place that was, you know, I didn't want to compete with him and mm -hmm. wanted to. So it was it was hard, you know, um, finding that right recipe. And then so I started doing some MMA and uh, one of my fights in Boston, um, Dana White happened to be there, told me about this thing called the Ultimate Fighter. And it was a fight I actually lost. It was the first fight I lost, but it was close enough. It was against this guy named Drew Fickett. Drew Fickett yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you know. And tough the, wrestler, fighter. Yeah, yeah tough. And, um, yeah, and, and I lost a split decision, but Dana came back. He's like, I thought you were going to get your ass kicked, kid. Like, I was looking at Drew Fickett to be a part of the show. Would, would you want to, you know, be a part of it or send us a, you know, have your brother interview you and, and send us in that tape? And I think I ended up sending in like a seminar DVD of me teaching or something that like that, like super late in the process. Mm. And they invited me out to Vegas. Um, and back then there was no tryouts. It was just they interviewed you and you got on. And I guess the rest is history. And it wasn't until I lost to Diego Sanchez in the finale of The Ultimate Fighter where I was like, okay, now I actually want to do this. You know, like I, I wanted to be a martial artist. I didn't necessarily want to be a fighter, but after that experience, I was like, okay, I can't go out like that. Like, I felt like I beat myself. I need to figure out where this fear is coming from, uh, what I need to do to get better, and like really approach us like a professional. And um, that that kind of was the the beginning of my MMA journey. Wow, wow. You know the the they took away the lightweight division. Yes. Um, and the UFC. Um, and then I remember because I stopped fighting, I was like, oh, there's no really goal. Yeah. Because I was fighting in King of the Cage at right, the time. Right, right. And uh, they took away the lightweight division. And I think you were the first fight back. Am I correct? You're I absolutely correct. Yeah. So when they brought the 155 pound division back, my fight against Sam Stout was the first one because they got rid of it. When BJ Penn had the draw against Qual Ono, like way back yeah, in yeah, the day, yeah, yeah, yeah. that was the last time they my, had the my, my, division. Because my king fight with Javier Vasquez was the same night. Wow. And uh, it was so boring. Like nobody, I guess nobody, yeah. It was yeah. The King of Cage, the, my thing, I guess they, what I heard, yeah. the pay-per-view was like like almost the same as the wow, UFC. Wow, you know? that's crazy. I'm not sure if it's, it's correct. It but could they, be. But they said because... It, it was, wasn't selling as much. It wasn't selling, yeah. Exactly. You know, it was, it was such a different time back then. They, yes, only, they got rid of. So they, they scratched. They the got lightweight rid of division. Yeah. They got rid of. They only used to have like four events a year. People forget. There Correct. Was one a quarter. Correct. There was one Correct. UFC a quarter. That's why everyone would be like waiting for that one UFC event every quarter, and um and and they just didn't really know what they were gonna do. And then obviously the Ultimate Fighter came back, brought back a lot of new fans, and they're like, wait a sec, maybe we can bring this division back and. Yeah, so you, were, so you were the first one back. I was the first I remember one back. I, I yeah, thought man. it was, yeah. Good memory, yeah, yeah. That's good, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, because the Diego Sanchez, it was like up to 170. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So the Ultimate Fighter was at 185, and oh, the lowest weight class was 170. So after the Ultimate Fighter, Diego and I were fighting at 170. 170. You know? Um, wow, so yeah. it was up to 185. So you, they threw a lightweight into the, the middle <laughs> yeah. weight division. Yeah. yeah. How many weight divisions did you fight in? So I fought in four different weight divisions. I fought at 185, I fought at 170, wow. fought at 155, and then I fought at 145. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a long ways away from that. But uh, <laughs> Which one was the best uh, best weight for you, you feel like? 155. That, yeah. that was my most natural weight class where you cut. I cut a little bit of weight. But I always felt strong, always felt good. At 145, that was horrible. I was miserable. <laughs> I felt like I was dying. And even it affected me the next day. Like, I had two fights at 145, one against Diego Nunez. Um, and that I felt like I had uh, energy, but I didn't have, like, strength. And then when I fought Aldo, I felt like I didn't have energy and I didn't have strength. Yeah. <laughs> so excuse me. But yeah, so th that was rough, man. Like I, even warming up for the Aldo fight, um, I remember when I got my hands wrapped, you know, Keith would always check and be like, yeah, how's, yeah, the, yeah. How's, how's the wrap? You know, how does it feel? Squeeze my hands, squeeze my wrists. And he's like, all right, squeeze. I'm like, I am. He's like, okay. <laughs> like I, I had no strength. And yeah. then I remember warming up, hitting pads before that fight. And I was like two minutes in and my legs were cramping. Um, so I was like, no warm up. I gotta save everything for the fight. So that was 
that was interesting. Uh, you know, just dealing with that and also understanding that, like, I, I of course, experienced it before where there was, like, staff infection or, like, cuts or other yeah. little injuries before a fight. But, like, you're not always going to be 100% for a fight, right? It's just injuries, it, everything. Injuries, yeah. everything. You know, same with jiu-jitsu, right? But it's one of those things where you have to deal with it. You're in it now. You committed to do this and do your best regardless. You know, find a way to win. Yeah, I remember, uh, I think we talked about it years ago, but just cutting down to that, because I cut down to 145 for some, you know, grappling tournaments yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, my best weight was like 155, 160, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in jujitsu, but I did the featherweight for a little bit, you know, just yeah. to kind of whatever. And, uh, man, like those, uh, what do you call that when you get like the, the ulcers, like in the, uh, like the, the food kind of comes back up. Yes. What's yes. that called? Uh, um, acid reflux. Acid reflux. Something like yeah. that. I would get that for years after. Damn. Right. And yeah. just stuff. And you know, you don't. You know how it was. You know, like and I don't know. I, I, I felt myself like um, just years after, like just began being like beat or just beat, not beat down, but um, like broken down. Yes. Broken down. You know, like wasn't good for me. Yeah. Oh yeah, man. Like it. That stuff's tough, and it's especially tough if you're fighting, right? Because your right. brain needs to be rehydrated. Getting and punched all in that. the face, yeah, yeah punched in the head. <laughs> it's probably not good. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then they made all these rules where you can't do uh, IVs and stuff, right. right? Exactly. So now you know you really got to be on top of your game, and also you know I, I do feel like you know the nutrition game. You know, people have learned a lot from it. The rehydration game, you yeah. know, like all that stuff. I think they have dialed in a lot better whereas back then i was probably somewhere in between it being scientific and kind of being a guinea pig you know right, I, right. And, and i found the best guys i could would you, you use know, free nutrition uh, so i had uh i had lockhart um you know george lockhart uh who you know had worked with connor and all that stuff after but you know he was new ish to the game back mm. then prior to that i had a guy named jesse cripple nikki who was a triathlete triathlon coach as well in boston and he used to manage my my weight cutting which was like he was unbelievable he was he was probably the best guy that i had if i'm being honest mm. but i didn't use him for 145 pounds because he felt that 145 was was not going to be possible it's not good and for you. he didn't really want to be a part of it and really was unsure of how to actually even go about that process um and then there was this, a couple guys that i interviewed um i was like do you think i can get down to 145 and both of them like yeah i know i think I, I think you can yada 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 i ended up going with george lockhart and you know and and, and you know listen i also think that after the diego nunez fight i could have been better about staying on it you know i think that you know how it is sometimes you you do a fight camp and you're like i'm just gonna let my hair down for a few days and i'm gonna eat whatever right to kind of replenish and just feel good and then get back into it um and sometimes you do that for too long your body's not ready or your body's like actually like protecting itself from having to lose weight again and it just holds on to everything um so i i i take some of that responsibility as well if i'm being honest like i could have been better about it more more responsible more disciplined it's, but it's hard though man like, yeah it's, a, it's, it's like hard e the eating distorts how eating disorders are created yeah, right? no, seriously <laughs> seriously yeah man it, you're absolutely because right. the trauma of not eating for so long suffering for so long i, I might still be suffering for <laughs> <laughs> i'm right there with you <laughs> i don't want to lose weight anymore man just don't make me do it <laughs> Yeah, because the diet is one thing, and yeah. then how about the dehydration of Dude, the day of the weigh-in? I'm telling you, like, you know, you went down, show me the sauna downstairs. It probably took me. Um, this is no bullshit. Like, probably four years of looking at a sauna and having to take a deep breath just looking at it. I, it was like PTSD. Like, I, I, I would look at it and be like. Whew, I, I would literally get anxiety from seeing the, the damn thing. <laughs> yeah, I hear you, man. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> so, and now, now people have different, like, back then, I think, um, like, the hot tub was starting up a right. little bit more. Like jacuzzi. And, and I had never done that, so I was like, it's too much of a gamble for me to just do that. Because, like, your head gets so hot, too, in there. I like thick hair, and I'd be like, almost feel like my head is going to explode from being in that sauna for so long. I remember um, Greg Jackson's crew was in uh, the sauna. And I went in from the first Greg Jackson guy to the last Greg Jackson guy. I think it was Brian Stan. 
and he was like, he's like, dude, I remember you being in there for every Greg Jackson fighter all the way through from when they started to when they ended. And they were all coming in at different times. He goes, and you were in there <laughs> the whole time. He's like, I couldn't even comprehend what you were going through. And it was, it's bad. You know, like you get this vision quest sometimes, you know, it's like th there's the world title. There's your dreams of becoming a world champion, your dreams of like pushing through and all that stuff. And like, you know, the fighter mentality is like, I'm not going to stop. Do it I'm gonna, trying. I, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Like I committed to this. I'm not going to be that dude, you know, who didn't make weight or didn't get this out, like through this opportunity away. I worked too hard to not. You, know. you had three title fights. You had, yeah. uh, was it Sean Shirk? Sean right? Shirk. Sean yeah. Shirk was the first one. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, BJ. Um, BJ, BJ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first one was interesting. You know, that one against Sean Shirk, that was one of those things where I had little to no experience. I think I had seven fights at the time, something like that. I forget what my is, record is. Is that the fight where you cut him? Yes. Yes. And, and he everywhere. had like, yeah. And he had like 40 fights you or had something this, you like had that. that. You had that, like that cutting From the elbow. bottom. Yeah. yeah. No, it, would cut every, it would cut everybody and stop the fights. <laughs> and it's, well, here's what's funny about that is that like, I, uh, so walking out to that fight, I was like, you know, I came out in the samurai outfit because in my mind, I was like, I'm outgunned. Yeah. I yeah. got to be ready to die here. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, yeah. it. And uh, he ended up winning. He ended up winning a decision. I cut him during the fight. It was it was like an absolute war. It was one of the bloodiest fights in UFC history. And I cut him. But in that process, because he was on top of me for a large portion of that fight, he was bleeding all over me. So I had his blood everywhere in my eyes in my ears in my mouth in my nose in my hair in my and um i st i came out with white shorts and you would never have known they were literally like brown or red at the end of the fight and um that was I an experience that, man, man. That, that was yeah. crazy yeah, yeah. <laughs> and those were like man what's cool about those days i think though you know i love the ufc now of yeah. course and we watch yeah. you know all the big events and stuff yeah but back in those days it was like so special being on spike tv that yeah. spike tv era yes was you know i don't know if it's nostalgic was because that time but it was just every event was special and we watched every event every event well i mean I, back in the day it was only like four every one every quarter or something right like that. right but then, but then it got sped up we had like the fight, the fight nights. nights and the ultimate fighter finales that's what made it so different was like whoa like this is a whole different shift this is like a paradigm shift in mma and the awareness of mma you know because how many times back in the day especially when you started, you started a few years before me, I think, where someone's like, you do what? What's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? And yeah. you had to explain to everybody, well, it's kind of like, you know, those guys in the UFC, they do the grappling and the Gracies. You had to explain the whole story. Now, yeah. any everybody Joe knows Ro what UFC Joe is. Joe Rogan is marketing it on TV yeah. every, every, sh every fight. Exactly. And, like, the Especially sport the has beginning. changed so much. And now it's worth, like, you know... Even like the the past owners bought it for like four point four billion. Now I think it's valued at like twelve billion. I mean, it's it's wild, man. It, it's it's wild how far we've come, and um, it's it's great to see because now you know the opportunities for the fighters are so much different. Yeah. Um, you know they can make legitimate business out of themselves even if they're not world champions. Right, and right. It's um, it's a completely different dynamic, man. Yeah. yeah, I remember asking Greg Jackson back in the day when before like the Ultimate Fighter. Yeah. Like, what's your goal? And he's like, I just want to be, you know, he just really believed in MMA. Yeah. I wanted to be known as, like, he looked up looked, looked up to, Matt, like, Pat Militech, you yes. know, because he had all these UFC champions. Yes. That's what he wanted. But I never believed in the MMA, like, scene, you know? Right. I, just, I didn't see the opportunity. Yeah. I didn't see it going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I love jujitsu. Right. And I did it just to kind of prove my jujitsu in right. the cage. Totally. Yes. Um, but he always believed in MMA. And then, sure enough, fast forward, and he got like some MMA Coach of the Year awards, yeah. And, yeah. and he had, you know, the all these UFC champions from almost every weight category. Yes, and uh, he really did it, you know. And uh, Ultimate Fighter, right? The all the, those things kind of put them on the map as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that was kind of the the last attempt by the Fertitas to go. All right, if this doesn't work, right, the business is over. I mean, that's supposedly the story was that. The Ultimate Fighter season one was their last attempt at trying to get this sport to the next level, and they're like, "We can't be, we can't be bleeding money if this doesn't work." And 
it became a hit. You know, thankfully, not because of my fight against Diego you, Sanchez. Fight, I got fight my was first, kicked. right? So, yeah. So I, I was so it, there was basically the two finales. And it was me and Diego. Was first was for the first finale, and then it was Forrest and Stefan. Forrest and, and Stefan was the one that everybody started calling each other on. Exactly. Hey man, there's this crazy fight going on. You gotta you gotta tune in, and yeah. everybody started tuning in. Yeah. And that's they literally like break it down to that that saving the UFC from that fight. That fight it turned it around, turned it around. It's crazy how like one fight can do a lot of things. You know, I talk about this a lot. How one fight can make an event. One fight can sometimes break an event. One fight can make your career. Sometimes one fight can break your career. You know, like you never know yeah. like when that last situation is going to be. So it's like this crazy opportunity that that we all have when we get a chance to compete when it matters. And um, you know, a lot a lot can happen, man. There's a lot on the line and. You know, it's, it's something that I think maybe people forget about, too, is that the life of a fighter is extremely stressful in that, you know, you're always working towards that next fight, right? And and it's always something bigger and always something that means a little bit more. Your job could be on the line. An opportunity could be on the line. More money is on the line. You're, you're training like crazy all the time. Um, you know, and, and it's... It's something that you kind of need to manage really well and and kind of be ready for. So, it's not all you know. Um, it's not all rainbows and sunshine for sure. You know, people look from the outside and like they see the UFC fighters living this life now, but uh, it, it's tough. And maybe even some fighters that even, are are, even are today, doing right? it now yeah, they, yeah. that don't understand. They're like yeah. they think it's about being famous and wealthy and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But you gotta love this game, man. You gotta you gotta really love it and and. Um, it's too tough. It's too tough yeah. on a sport. What I appreciate about it, your brother was always with you. He, he stopped everything and went to all the mm -hmm. events with you. Yeah. You know, it was like your your right hand man. It seems like you know, and all the and all the all the the journey probably from jujitsu on, right? He was man. You know, like I, I think about that a lot. You know, Keith was. Um, you, you, everyone needs someone in their life that's always going to have their back, and you know, no one's going to do that better than family. Um, they're going to tell you what they think no matter yeah, what. Yeah. Uh, they're going to be real with Honest, you. Yeah. They're going to look out for you. Um, and, yeah, they're going to be that, you know, supportive structure. And, and he was always that. And, you know, he was always the guy that was able to push me, you know, even mentally. Like, mentally, Keith was super tough. You know, he, he was physically, I think, more talented than me in a lot of ways. Um, uh, but he also helped me a lot me mentally with certain things to like training hard. I mean, the first time he went in Brazil and Keith's out there like doing really well. And yeah. like, I wasn't in my first session and Keith comes over to me after the session. He's like, what are you doing, man? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, he's like you got to go after these guys. He's like, I don't care if they're Brazilian or if they're black belts or whatever, whatever they are. He's like, you got to get after him. He's like, you're not training like you do in Massachusetts. He's like, you need He's like, go at him, man. And like, I was like, oh, wait, he's right. Like, I I was giving them too much respect. And, you know, like, yeah. like, so he had that mentality. So he was, it was just little things like that where he'd, he'd be able to remind me of, like, what I'm doing this for, how I'm doing it, what I should be doing. And, uh, you know, we came up together, like, what, beating what each other up. For? What were you doing for? So I, I think, like, more of, like, you know, reminding me, like, are, are you trying to, you know, because I would always do it to learn, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's great. Awesome. But, um, you know, like reminding me of like, you're doing this to win and you're doing this to be the best. So are you making the most out of this session right now? And I, it, it, so it was just a little bit different of a mentality of like giving me that little bit of edge and intensity that I probably needed. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit more of a timid person or tended to be a little bit more timid. And uh, Keith definitely leans the more aggressive side. So he, he helped to kind of give me that balance of like, hey, man, this isn't a game. This isn't just a game where you're kind of just like happy go lucky. You know, let's just see what happens. It's like, dude, you're getting ready for that dude. And there's that Let's dude who's going to try to fucking kill, kill you. You, <laughs> you know, and there's they're out there. You know, not everybody. But like if you're going to fight at an elite level, there's certain dudes out there let's be real like that like enjoy hurting you yeah and you yeah. better be ready for it yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. he would kind of remind me about that you know kind of give me that nasty edge a little bit <laughs> yeah because yeah, you're one of the you know consider like the nice guys right but yeah. you know, when it's fight time it's fight time yeah 
but uh, yeah, it's got a lot of guys bad, bad intentions. Yeah, yeah, man, and and it's it's just different, you know. It's like, and and there's certain guys out there even today. Like you can see, there's certain guys that are the athletes, certain guys that are the martial artists, and there's certain fighters. And then you get the the rare ones are the ones that are kind of a combination of all of that. But you, you kind of have to harness all that stuff yeah. of like, you know, what are you going to do to be smart to win? What are you going to do to be tough in order to win when you need it? What are you going to do? You know, so are you learning constantly? So there's the martial artist aspect. So there's so much, man. There's so much to, you know, being being a pro fighter in the UFC. Successful you know? pro fighter, right? And now there's gyms everywhere. There's there's gyms everywhere. People are, you know, all learning kind of the same stuff now. There's there's more of like a, a way to train back then. We were all trying to figure it, you know, figure it out. I think we yeah. still are, but like yeah. they know way more than we did back then. You know, I think in a lot of ways. Yeah, I feel like you always train pretty smart, and I, so I was trying to pick your brain, Thank and you, your man. brother's brain, you know, just to see how to train and yeah. what you guys are doing. Thanks, because you're having success, right? Yeah, it was work. It was working, and you know, it wasn't always perfect, but I, I did feel like. We had a nice balance of, you know, not killing ourselves in sp right. like crazy, stupid sparring right, sessions, right, right. Um, but also, you know, not slacking. You know right, what I mean? Right, How right. do I find that that regimen of like working hard, doing skill development, you know, analyzing stuff, you know, balancing the strength and conditioning work with the, you know, all the other things, and you know, um, it's it, it was a process, man. It's it's tough, tough balance, yeah, right? Yeah, tough to balance yeah, everything. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember Pat Miletic, right? The guy's legendary, like, uh, gym fights, right? Yeah. But they would, you know, they're all concussed. They're all, you know, Robbie Lawler, right? Later on in his career, I don't think he even sparred, right? No. Uh, Robbie talked about this, and Jens Pulver talked about this. But, like, it was to the point where they'd get a kick out of, like, all right, let's see who's going to get knocked out this mm -hmm. time. What the, Who's going to get knocked out today? Who's going to get knocked out tomorrow? And they didn't. They weren't really understanding that, like, hey, this is something that's not good for you. You're getting ready for a fight, um, and you want to preserve your brain. You want to get it. So, yeah, that, that, um, Robbie, later on, he said that was kind of one of the things that helped revitalize his career. He actually stopped sparring, you know, uh, didn't do, like, big glove sparring, was, wasn't going 100% against guys anymore, and, and um, I'm sure that helped a lot. And Max Holloway is one of those guys that supposedly mm. doesn't do crazy hard sparring. You know, um, and, you know, I, I think there's some value to that, too. You know, you can do controlled sparring without having to kill each other uh, and still get an idea of, you know, how it works, how it yeah. goes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and they, I remember Greg Jackson back in the day, like, the guys used to spar so hard, and then later on, the same thing, they shifted, too. So I think the whole, the whole, everybody, right, you've gotten smarter. Yeah, man, years. absolutely. And, and you know, I, I remember Hodger Gracie talking about this. You know, once you get choked out, you get choked out, you know, easier. Yeah. And once you get knocked out, you get knocked out easier. So it's um, it's something to manage for sure. Yeah. Man, going back to announcing, you, uh, I think you were, you announced Conor McGregor as first UFC fight as well in yeah. Ireland, right? Yeah, yeah, well, in Sweden. Sweden. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It felt like it was Ireland because it was so loud in there, but... Yeah, man, that was that was crazy because I'd heard about Connor for a long time actually, and I'd watched him fight over in um, was it Cage Warriors, right? Um, right. And when he UK. was a champion in the UK and double champion, right? Double champ, exactly. One forty five and one fifty five, and and I was always excited to see him in the UFC one day. And finally, he came over and had an opportunity to call his first fight, and he had an amazing performance against uh, Marcus Brimage, I believe, and. Uh, it would just look spectacular. And, and I think people forget just how talented he was and how ahead of the game he was at some point. You know, he has such a, he had such a unique, unique style when he came under the scene as with his striking. Now, a lot of people are kind of adopting that style and have adopted it. Um, but he just looked so unique and so different. And man, uh, it, it's, it's wild. You know, you were talking about how the UFC got rid of the 155 pound division because mm -hmm. no one was watching. Right. Well, here's this dude fighting at 145 pounds, 155 pounds that now everybody wanted to see because it was back in the back in the day. It was really you wanted to see the heavyweights and you want to see the light heavyweights so like Chuck Liddell, Randy right, Couture, right, big right. deals. Heavyweight champions were big deals. Andre Olovsky, Tim Sylvie, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. so they're big guys. But um, the little guys didn't get a whole lot of attention. And the fact that he was able to do that, he was such a, like a dynamo and like his, he had so much charisma to bring people in to watch him at 145, 155 pounds is, is pretty crazy. Now he's one of the most 
famous athletes on the planet. It's pretty, pretty yeah. crazy. There's press conferences, right? Yeah. Oh, my post, gosh. Post, post speeches, <laughs> post fight speeches. Legendary. Did you also do the, was there one in Ireland that you did? I didn't. No, so okay, Ireland's okay. been like one of the few countries that I haven't been to that okay. I want to go to. But um, yeah, I think he fought Diego Brandao there. And okay. I always wanted to go, but uh, I, I wasn't I wasn't uh, called for that one. You were for that first fight, though. I remember, yeah. cause I remember you yeah. talking about it because yeah. you, were, you, were, you were in L.A. already. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Yep. You're yeah. talking about, oh, man, this is crazy. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. How many Irish fans came over? A lot, man. A lot. I mean, it was nuts. And it, I don't even think he was on the main card. He might have been, but I don't think so. I, he might have been a, a prelim. And it sounded, I mean, loud as hell when he came out. Yeah. Um, and he wasn't even, you know, like a UFC vet. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. What were some of your favorite spots to go travel to? Man, I really loved Seoul, Korea. I loved Seoul. I loved oh. Tokyo. Um it's different. Like I, I don't know if I would necessarily live there, but I just found it to be people really nice, really kind. Um, it was really clean. Is there a city. UFC in, in Korea? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I called an event there. I remember me and my wife went over and um, had a blast. Like the food was awesome. Um, you know, everything was really easy to get around. Like we took public transportation we couldn't oh, like wow. read anything but we could figure it out yeah, you know yeah, it was yeah, just yeah. like everything was super on time yeah. really clean yeah. you know so that was uh that was really cool we had a blast there and tokyo was really cool just because it's such a different culture you know i think both of those places are so different the ufc in japan uh, the tokyo yes yes so i, I right. called a couple fights over there one of them was just brian stand against vanderley silva which uh, was a really cool one and um yeah it's just a such a different culture and also like a different martial arts um vibe too like the the fans there are super quiet you know clapping quietly yeah. and even the ufc and huh? yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah it was really neat yeah. yeah i got an opportunity to go to a pride oh yeah oh wow when uh st when they still had the pride with the uh was it uh quentin jackson mm -hmm. and uh, arona oh wow wow that and fight was crazy he got him yes. in a triangle and he picked them up and slammed them down and knocked uh, arona out yep Man, Arona is one of those guys that people forget about how much of a beast he was. Not, not only in MMA, but as a grappler. Like Man. he was taken down like guys Just like raw. Mark Kerr. And like yeah, he yeah, was, yeah. he was a beast athletically. He was a savage man. Um, but yeah, people, people forget what a force he was. Yeah, Man. yeah. Character to charisma, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And pride to UFC too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But crazy days, man. The pride days. I remember like getting up, watching fights early, like, the middle of the night, and, like, oh, man, Fedor and Crow Cop, and I was such a Pride fanboy, which is why, like, I always wanted to fight Gomi, you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I always saw him as, like, the best 155-pounder. Right, right, and, right, right. And then uh, I got to fight him in, in uh, his UFC debut, so that was, like, a dream come true for me. And, and uh, so, yeah, I, I watched so much Pride, man. Like, when he was beating the Gracie, he was like, I want to fight him one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Those were those days. <laughs> Yeah, man. Who was the the first lightweight superstar from Japan? Um, um, he did those flying arm bars. Oh, um, gosh. Takanaru Gomi beat him. Yes, that's that's how he made his name. Yes. Um, he fought in Shudo a bunch. What the heck? And he fought in ADC. Too. He he competed in ADCC yeah, too. Why yeah. am I blanking on? I his know name? me too. Awesome arm locker. Um, really dynamic. Yeah, Gosh. but yeah, because because yeah. Javier Vasquez went and beat 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 him as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. After that's that's how Javier Vasquez when I was he was king of the cage. Yes, kind of like oh wow, you beat him. So right, in, like, as far as the lightweights, right? Right, yeah, it was him. They had a bunch of great fighters back then. So there was it was him, it was Qual Ono, it was Genki Sudo, Genki Sudo, yeah, Domi. Like that was kind of like the four or five guys that were. But like, that guy that he was the one who put the lightweight division. Yes, he was the one. He was the the king because he was you know, he was doing all these flying arm bars. Yep, that's super dynamic. Yep, we gotta look it up, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Talking about Gomi, uh, <laughs> old school fights. Uh, who else did he fight? I'm trying uh, to think. Like, who was the Javier Vasquez? Javier Vasquez. Look him up. You know, who he fought? In See Japan. his fight record. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that dude was gnarly, man. Like his uh, his flying arm bar used to catch everybody with it. I remember actually studying him, right? Because I always wanted to learn how yeah. to do a flying arm yeah, bar, yeah. And, and I hit it a couple times. Because um, he made but, it exciting, right? Yeah, he made the fights exciting. And he was doing it nogi, man. Like he, like it's it was crazy. But um, 
Th those were cool days, you know, the Shuto fights, the Pancrase fights, and that's where, you know, most of the lighter weight fighters um, the the best ones in the world anyway. We're fighting over in Japan right. for a long time because just they the were Shudo, doing it. Yeah, yeah. The Takanagomi and all these guys. Yeah. What's his name? Oh, what's that? Oh no no. This so Javier Vasquez. There there should be a Japanese fighter on his record um, that he fought. Yeah, mm -hmm. Javier Vasquez on his fight record. Um, Both of us go blank. Okay, uh, I, that was, I was like, oh man, you, I'm gonna you be so angry when I hear the name. I'm like, oh, no, we got to give him a shout out yeah, for dude. sure. He was a legend. Like, yeah, he was the first like light, like lightweight yeah. superstar. What year would that have been? Like 2005, 2006. Yeah, around that time. A little earlier. Yeah, so a little earlier in his career. He was the first lightweight superstar. Yes, 155 for sure. Version, for sure. Do you see it on his MMA record? No, no, no. Like, uh, like uh, on his overall. Like, if you Wikipedia, in there, like, yeah, case? around two thousand, actually twenty, two thousand two, two thousand one. Yeah, it could be earlier. Yeah, that's yeah. when you fought him. Yeah, okay, there you go. Because I, no, I'm sorry, two thousand two. Yeah, because I fought him in two thousand three. So, I think it was two thousand two. Nice. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, man. That, that's, <laughs> that's crazy. crazy at the time, I wasn't even <laughs> fighting back then at that time. You know. <laughs> Nothing. Well, yo, yo. Yes, Rumino Sato. Oh my God, dude, <laughs> Rumino Sato. Oh Sato. <laughs> sorry, sorry, man. sorry, sorry. Yes, <laughs> yes. Damn, the great Rumino Sato. Yeah, dude. Oh man, him and his dad. That's how all those guys made. That's how Takanori Gomi made his name. Yes, that's how. Yes. Like you know, even Javi Vasquez. That's how that's he got right. like, like credibility, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, man. Wow. That's, that's, where, like, that's where the lightweight division, the best guys in the light division were. Yes. Were in Shuto. Yes. Yes. I mean, again, like 2002, and they were already fighting for, you know, a while, you know, in Shuto. Yep. Uh, so that's uh, that's impressive, man. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I see you wearing the Shoei Roll, always yes. representing the Shoei Roll. Yes. <laughs> man. They're the best. I remember there was a story because they made they made the they used to have you used to walk out with their shirts like yes. shirt shirts you yeah always representing yes and uh, and uh, and then one day like tap out was gonna pay you so much yeah. that you had to switch to tap out like <laughs> you told bears like hey bro like I, we gotta we gotta take this money we gotta take this tap out <laughs> money you know but you don't want to but I know. you guys like couldn't say no at that, at that point you know exactly. but you still rep like uh, even though like you know, <laughs> He's the Dude, rep show. It's, role. it's hilarious. <laughs> you you literally like I was just talking about this like a day or two with the guys. And um, you know, I was like, if if they pay me this amount, then I'll wear it. And then they're like, they're like, yes. I was like, okay, like, well, I'll do it. But and yeah, it was so much money, you know, especially back then for me. It was like it was literally fund my whole month of training for plus sure more like for it was sure. pay all my expenses everything it was like cool i could just focus on training like i could just focus on my own training like awesome but uh show your role i think it was back in maybe 2005 or 2006 where they would send me out shirts it was like 50 limited edition shirts it was like ken flow shirts yeah, made yeah, by yeah, show yeah. roll yeah. and i would sell those and that would help pay for my training and my travel for like my coaches and stuff like that and bear like you know back then no one knew who show your role really right, was right right but you know bear was just setting they this up and supporting geese, me man. yeah yeah that's it, that's it and to see that you know they're the biggest most popular jujitsu uh, clothing company in the world you know now it's why it's it's pretty cool man the, the sport has changed so much and to see like all these good people that have been around for a while that are doing big things and have been able to make a successful life for themselves man it's like you know you had hoped back then when we were starting right, like right. maybe one day i can actually make money from this you know it, it, it almost seems so far away but now it's here man it's, yeah. it's here and, and just kind of it's the it, uh, it's a reminder of like the power of like all these people that are pushing towards their goals, even if it's something that isn't like popular at the time, you can make it so, you know, yeah. so as long as you like work hard and, you know, develop things and like your your heart's in the right place, you know, and, and uh, you know, everything from MMA to the Jiu Jitsu world. Yeah. I mean, everybody knows what Jiu Jitsu is now. Yeah. You look yeah. at, you know, how popular these tournaments are. IBJJF is like. 
thousands killing it. Thousands, They're so yeah. powerful. You know, the Jiu-Jitsu Nogi Grappling League, Tournament. Yeah, we have Flow Grappling now showing events every weekend. Yeah. You know, there, there's, there's jiu-jitsu competitors that are making millions of dollars from instructionals and, you know... <laughs> It's wild. Yeah. It's yeah, wild, man. Yeah. 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 Back in the day, there was like barely any events that may, paid any money. Yeah. And, and who knows in 10 years? Minimal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Could be on ESPN one day. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I was going to say about um, um, just, you know, when I was first started teaching, you know, like this year or the end of this year, it's going to be 25 years of having a gym, right? Damn, man. So wow. Legacy will be 25 years <laughs> end of this year. It's crazy. Wow. But uh, I remember you know, you're talking about people didn't know what jujitsu was. Me making copies of VHS tapes yes. of Gracie in action. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the other one I used was the choke, the choke documentary, documentary with Hicks and Gracie. So good, dude. Yeah. And so that's how I educated people on how jujitsu worked and how it was effective, and it, you know, yeah, getting people interested. That's awesome. As an intro, I did I would do like some kind of class, and then I would give them a hey, check this out. That's awesome. I. I one of the ways that I <laughs> one of the ways that I was making money back in the day when I was a poor jujitsu guy um, was I would make different mixtapes. So one of the tapes that I, I made was I got all of Margarita's jujitsu match. Remember mm. Fernando Margarita yeah, Ponches? Yeah. One of the great, I made all of his jujitsu goes, matches yeah. and I put it on one tape and I called it the Margarita mix. And I used some of Mark Lehman's stuff and we you know we like hey do you mind if I do this? Like yeah no problem. He's like we'll trade tapes. So I used to sell tapes and trade tapes with people like Ricardo, uh, Ricardo Amendolia uh, yeah, out yeah, in Canada. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So I would like sell tapes, trade tapes just to learn and then make money on the side. So I'd like send out a tape for like 15 bucks and they would. You that's know, how you would learn. That's how, there, was, yeah. there was no YouTube. There was exactly. no. There was, that's how you got information. 100 percent. 100 percent. So it's like now, you know, it, it's good in some ways and bad in some ways because not all information is great. But um now the kids, they go on YouTube, they look up stuff, they can look at competitors, they have other people that are breaking down the matches Instagram, for them. Yeah, Instagram, all you know, uh, all the different, you know, streaming things that you can do to buy and learn from. It was so different, whereas back in the day, as we were kind of started the conversation, we had to go to Brazil to go and, and, and learn, right? There was like, a guy, Paqueta, do you remember that guy? Paqueta, yeah, man. He used to sell them out of his, his, out of his uh, trunk, yeah. The VHS tapes yes, out of his trunk. Dude. I remember him very well. I would go and I, I was one of his best customers, <laughs> probably me and my brother. <laughs> yeah, dude. Wow, That's how you man. got info. Yeah. VHS tapes. VHS no, tapes. No one even knows what those are right now. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, you look great, man. Thank healthy, you, man. You too. I'm doing yeah. okay. I'm doing all right, man. You know, I uh, I need to be better with my uh, diet, but uh, other than that, we'll blame the we'll blame the the weight cuts. You yeah, know? Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Not me, not me. It's the weight cuts. <laughs> no, yeah, man, I, I'm doing all right. I, I've been I've been getting into uh, a lot of shooting actually. Um, I've been I've been kind of fascinated with learning and being good at a pistol. Mm. So I've been focusing on that. I guess for I've been shooting three years now. Wow. And that so that's been one thing that has kind of supplemented. So I can. Probably I'm only able to train about two times a week, maybe three times a week. Mm -hmm. My back kind of gets a little beat up and, and, you know, I need to be holding my kids, playing with my kids and doing all that stuff. So to me, um, it's, it's tough for me to just train more than twice. My body gets beat up. So I've, I do my strength conditioning twice a week. I do my jujitsu once or twice a week. I do, uh, boxing once a week if I can. And so I get my switch workouts up, yeah. in and then switch it up. So my back's not taking all of it, all the training. But one thing that I'd like to start getting into it from a competition standpoint without my back getting destroyed is shooting. And, and it's been fun, uh, learning that process. I, I, it's a lot like martial arts. So that's been cool for me and, you know, having fun doing that. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, that's that's what I've been into. And the man. dad life, right? The dad Beautiful life, little, yeah, little man. Little girl, little boy. Yeah, yeah. So you know, my daughter, um, you know, I I I play around with her and my son doing jujitsu a lot. You know, again, kind of that similar Gracie approach where like they don't realize they're learning jujitsu, but they're doing jujitsu, and uh, hopefully they'll get to a, a point where they can do it formally. Um, 
you know, over there uh, in Charlotte. Lucas Lepre's gym is over there. Okay. So I'd like to bring you're, him you're over there. You're in Charlotte? Yeah, I'm in Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina. So um, I, I train thought at Lucas's. I you were Lucas's. in South Carolina, weren't you? Uh, no, I was at one point. Exactly. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. so when we first moved out of L.A., uh, we were staying in South Carolina trying to figure out exactly where we were going to be. Um, and uh, we ended up, you know, choosing Charlotte. And, um, yeah, so that's been that's been cool, dude. Um and uh, hopefully get them into it. They're, they're into, you know, they do like little strength conditioning workouts. There's like a kid things called a thing called Kid Strong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they kind of do the little workouts and gymnastics. And my daughter does dance. And um, but uh, hopefully get them into some some formal training soon. So my son's only two, but yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He'll, he'll, he'll gotta get him moving in. Yeah, yeah. 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 You self, do you see yourself doing a, another school? <sighs> As of right now, no. Um, you know, I have I have a gym, at, like I said, Florida Martial Arts Center in Brookline, Massachusetts. But um, as far as where I'm at, Keith and I have discussed it. It's possible. It's hard with my travel schedule because, you know, there's a couple things. The travel schedule, I want to be able to be consistent with it. And I don't have help as of right now of someone who could fill in for me. You know, so I'm still relatively new to the area and all that stuff. So right now... Um, it's a behemoth. It can be a behemoth, and yeah, I, if I do it, I want to make sure. Yeah, yeah, I want to make sure I'm able to do it right. So right now, um, I kind of enjoy the freedom of being able to do other things without like having to be rooted there. So, with my schedule, it's it's it can be hard. So, maybe one day though, you know, maybe one day. But as of right now, in the near future, no. Just enjoying. Just enjoying learning, man. training. Yeah, yeah. So. Kind of nice to be a student. What, what have you been up to? Your PFL? Your, uh, so yeah. I was doing PFL for a little bit. I, I stopped um, doing stuff for the PFL. Um, you know, I, I definitely want to continue doing uh, commentary. You know, I, I still do stuff for BattleBots. Um, but uh, right now, just really kind of doing my podcast with John Anik and... You know, maybe some other opportunities. So I just saw that he announced the most UFC fights, right? Yeah, yeah. John's been killing it, man. It, it's it's been really cool Shout to see to his. Yeah, yeah John's the man, dude. John's the man. He's actually the reason we really got the podcast going, and now the podcast has been killing it last year. And um, you know, after what uh, almost ten years of doing the wow. podcast, we 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 turned it into a good business. You know, last last year or so. So we've been grinding to make that happen and see bigger things in the future with that and and um as far as like broadcasting mma fights again you know for me um i, I would love to to do the ufc again you know i i uh, you know i you're part of the history man yeah I'm like, and, and know, i I'm, enjoy I'm one of your it. fans you know like thank always, you, since man. the beginning I, you know yeah thank you man underdogs I, that you know that weren't supposed to do anything but with hard and hard work yeah heart and hard work you know, made it make made it happen, made a career, you, and, and inspired a lot of people. I appreciate that, man. You know, I, I I'd love to do it. I'd love to kind of get back to it. I feel like if I'm going to do it, I'd love to do it at the highest level. And mm -hmm. the UFC fights are things I get excited about. So, yeah. who knows? You know, um, but uh, yeah. So we'll see what the future lies, man. But it, it's been fun. You know, I'm kind of going through like a like um, I don't know, maybe, maybe like some kind of newer process of figuring out exactly. Um, where I want to put my energy, what do I want to do? And, and thankfully I'm in a position where I can kind of do that a little bit. And, and, uh, but having free time with the family and being able to manage that stuff has been really cool. You know, um, your kids are only young once yeah. and, and getting yeah. a chance to kind of spend that time with them has been really cool. And, um, yeah. So yeah, love it, that. man. Yeah. Well, God bless, man. Yeah. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Dude. Look forward to you. Uh, getting on the mat with you today yeah man it's great uh, catching sure. up yeah dude. yeah yeah and, uh, look forward to the future thank you for our future thank you brother thank you